any questions before we begin? Two minutes. <laughs> is based on very straightforward equation and the syllabus tells you everything about uh, grading and uh, <coughs> syllabus 
and menu schedule also allows you to make a choice, stay or leave, depending on what you feel or you think you feel. And uh, labs this semester will be located in a different room, most of the labs. 128 on this floor and uh, <coughs> statistics shows that PY 105 of course positively affects students' attitude. There's no statistics about 106. I've never took any surveys after. So or maybe it will affect negatively, we don't know. But 105 uh, helps to boost confidence in uh, many students. First week of this course will be based on some of uh, the theory we've learned previously in mechanics. So I would recommend to refresh your knowledge about vectors and the vector and the, the components. Newton's second law work kinetic energy we will use it <coughs> and uh, this what we want uh, to learn I want you to learn you want me to teach <coughs> and uh, again it's very important because I'm going to ask you uh, probably four or five questions today and uh, this is the first one. And right now you have to log in the website and uh, don't answer anything because you have no idea what I'm asking about. <laughs> you have to be ready. So when I will prepare <coughs> the demonstration and I will show how it works, I will ask a question. So now just be ready. question again it's basically a review of the forces and the answer is what did you say none of the above it's not gravitational force <coughs> gravitational force always points down this force was pointing horizontally it's not elastic force no springs and uh, the force of tension technically is elastic force but it points down no friction buoyant force 
again, is vertical. So, of course, the answer is none of the above. But it is a force, which means we have no choice. We have to study the property of this force. And uh, in physics, it starts from giving the name, then measuring some variables and arriving at equation which relates those variables and then applying that equation for solving specific problems. Well, <coughs> the force has a name, electric force, from a Greek word which originally meant ember. And uh, the first type of experiments people used to, not even to study, but just to observe this force. Humidity. That's why I keep stuff outside. In the lab room, it's impossible to predict if uh, your air will be dry or humid. Humidity uh, negatively affects all these types of experiments. So depending on the day of the week, your lab might be very good or just awful. So here, electric force. Well, <coughs> first people have noticed that if uh, If you it's take so it's just the same slide. <coughs> just keep your eyes on something. And uh, yep, see, we can see a strange interaction between this rod, which initially wasn't doing anything, but after I got it rubbed with fur, now it starts attracting small pieces. And uh, uh, about a thousand years later, people have found that depending on how you <coughs> run your experiments, okay, we can see it attraction, and now That's going to work. Well, we can see repulsion. Depending on what is happening, we always observe either attraction or repulsion. Attraction, repulsion, repulsion, attraction. So only two situations. And to describe that new phenomenon in words, people say that <coughs> first, an object becomes charged. <coughs> So at first, when no interaction was observed, nothing was happening. So, let's see. Yeah, nothing is happening. So we, we, we say the object is neutral. If something starts happening, yeah, we say this rod becomes charged. And uh, <coughs> we can see that we observe only two types of being charged. One results in attraction, another results in repulsion. So historically they start people started calling those charges positive or negative. Could have been red and black or something else, doesn't really matter. But historically uh, we call them plus or minus. How do we see if something is charged? Well now we have devices which help us to see if there is any charge, well, not anymore, because it's humid, charge quickly leaking away. That's why I like this. It, it's made of good plastic which holds the charge for a very long time. Okay, maybe this is broken. <laughs> That's why I always have a backup. So you see, nothing. 
that means my hand doesn't have any charge. It's neutral. And we can see now something changes. So that means this guy has a charge. What kind of a charge? Positive or negative? At this point, we don't know. However, after well, I would say decades of experiments, people have learned that uh, there will be a slide that some materials almost always become negatively charged. Some materials almost always become positively charged, for example, and that depends on what pair of materials you you uh, mechanically put together. So, for example, if you use a piece of fur and plastic, plastic usually becomes negatively charged. If you use glass and fur, glass usually becomes positively charged. And there is a way in the future we will discuss it. How can we figure out when an object is negatively charged, when an object is positively charged? For now, we just know. And uh, this is a result of very sensitive, accurate experiments. The equation has a name of the physicist who discovered that equation, Coulomb, Coulomb's law. And it says that the magnitude of the force, electric force, between two small charged objects is proportional to the product of the charge of each object and inversely proportional to the distance between those charges. First of all, assumptions are made, small, tiny. Size doesn't matter. <coughs> and uh, uh, this equation doesn't tell us anything about the direction of the force. Again, it is magnitude, the strength of it, how many newtons. The direction comes from this rule. A positive charge and another positive charge will repel each other. A negative charge and another negative charge also will repel each other. But if we take one charge positive and another negative, in that case they will attract each other, like we saw. So we, we say shortly, like charges repel each other, and <coughs> opposite charges attract each other, and uh, this constant, Coulomb's constant or electric constant, is huge. If you remember, Newton's fourth law for gravitation has a constant with a power 10 to the negative 11. That's why gravitational force is very weak. It requires a lot of material. This is huge. So even small objects actually experience very strong force. We can see that <coughs> we can overcome force of gravity for those objects. We can lift them up. And we know the reason for that now, of course, if we look inside of anything, we see lots and lots of tiny particles. Well, first we see molecules, then atoms, and each atom also has a structure. Now we know very well, and you know from chemistry, <coughs> that inside of each atom we have a heavy nucleus, very heavy particle, heavy relative to particles orbiting. Those particles which orbit a nucleus we call electrons, negatively charged particles. And inside the nucleus we have protons. And each individual proton is very heavy, about 2,000 times heavier than a single electron. Now, we also know that each proton and each electron has exactly it has a charge of exactly the same magnitude, and that charge has a name, the elementary charge. Technically, we could have imagined that we charge a pin yeah. and then we cut it in half. So the charge should be divided in half. And we cu keep cutting, cutting, and cutting, and cutting. 
like uh, tearing apart a dollar bill. Eventually, you go to the smaller part, a cent. So, in a way, the elementary charge is like that. that it's the smallest portion of a charge called known to today in the universe. We cannot make it any smaller. We cannot break it in, into half. That's why we call it the elementary charge. <coughs> and uh, a standard letter for the elementary charge is lowercase e. And it always represents a positive number. It's like a G, always 9.8. Yeah. But an electron is negatively charged. For the electron, the actual charge is this. And here we use international system of units to measure charge. We use coulombs. And a value of coulomb just comes from measurements from application of coulomb's law. One <coughs> charge, second charge, measure force. Now, <coughs> every atom, unless we do something on it, is neutral. The total charge of every single atom is zero. It, it, it because every normal atom, not ion, has exactly the same number of electrons and protons. So for each proton inside the nucleus, we have one electron outside. They have opposite charge. If we add all charges together for each individual atom in the periodic table, we always get zero. Of course, we can break it. We can add an extra electron and make it a negative ion. Or we can remove an electron mechanically by rubbing, for example, and make it a positive ion. But every atom, which means every object in its natural state is neutral. Total charge is zero. Now, again, you should switch to, uh, to the web sign and uh, get ready for the question. of course. It's just much heavier than a ping pong ball. So this experiment actually is a model of what is happening inside an object when we try to apply a force to electrons or to protons. This ball represents electrons. The mass 
of the electron is 1 over 2000 of the mass of the proton. And actually, uh, a regular material, it's not just hydrogen, right? It's, I don't know, aluminum, iron. So a nucleus has many, many protons in it, plus other particles, neutrons. So a nucleus is actually a thousand times more massive than electrons, which means if we want to move a single nucleus or even a single proton inside an object, we have to apply a force which is much, much stronger than we need to apply to an electron to make it move. That's it. Which means in solids, any types of solids, protons never move. <coughs> when we take a piece of fur, and when we rub <coughs> back with fur, <coughs> we cannot move a single proton, but we can move electrons. How? Well, we can transfer some electrons from fur to the bat, or we can scratch off some electrons from the bat to the fur. That breaks the balance. If before we used fur, the bat was neutral, after this mechanical interaction, we break the balance, and normally this bat can absorb some extra electrons from fur. That based actually on chemical forces inside each material. So, whatever is happening inside of the objects involved in charging or discharging, it only based on the motion of electrons. Only electrons can move. Now, there are two types of uh, materials. Plastic, wood, glass. We call them insulators. In those materials, electrons, well, <coughs> if I take an electron and I place it here, it remains here. It cannot move along easily. We can try to make it move, but again, that would require some extra effort. In conductors, like uh, <coughs> steel, copper, zinc, electrons can easily move in any direction. So if I add some extra electrons <coughs> to a conductor, those electrons will run away from each other as far as possible. Why? Because they hate each other, no? Because they repel. There is a force of repulsion. So if they can move away from each other, they do. That's the difference between insulators and conductors. So, any experiment we're going to do today, or you're going to do in the lab, supposed to be explained in terms of electrons moving one way or another, in one direction, from one object to another object. And of course, we cannot create electrons, we cannot destroy <coughs> electrons, we only can move them, which means if we have an insulated system, let's say, object one, object two, we count how many electrons here, we count how many electrons here. Electrons might move from fur to the back, but if we count the total amount of electrons, it can't change. When something is not changing, when something remains constant or conserved, we call it the law of conservation. In that situation, this is the law of conservation of charge. An insulated system has constant total charge. Inside the system, change might happen. One object might become more negatively charged, another might become less negatively charged, but in the end, the total amount should remain the same. 
So please, let, let me know what you think about the situation. A deficiency. So, let's say I've got a piece of glass. Let's see. Glass really is not very easy charged. But if it charged, it usually loses electrons. Let's try silk. It's already a little bit wet. Oh, okay. Silk worked. So. Efficiency. What does it mean? It means we are taking electrons away from it and move it somewhere else. So in this experiment, uh, electrons are being scratched off by the piece of silk, so silk should get gain electrons. And each electron brings a negative charge with it. So silk should become negatively charged, and this should become positively charged. That's simple. Exactly. And that's how we can approach every experiment. Just think about what is happening to electrons. Now, uh, sometimes we need to discharge an object. Well, the easiest way to discharge is not using something which charges it. You want to do the opposite of that. And in that situation, the best way is using a conductor, some kind of a conductor which is easy to manage, like a piece of aluminum foil. Well, our hand also is a good conductor. But uh, sometimes, for example, this plastic is real good. Sometimes even hand cannot completely discharge it. Still has some charge left. So in that case, Conductor should help. I've seen people trying to charge a rod using the foil. No, that's a discharging element. Let's see. Still, well, but. Well, maybe this guy also has a charge. <laughs> All right. I killed the charge. And this uh, chart on the left has a name, a triboelectric series. It tells us normally what object would become positively charged, what object would become negatively charged if we put them together. For example, uh, glass and uh, silt. Glass should become positive, silk, silk should become negative, uh, and uh, plastic and fur, plastic becomes negative, fur becomes positive. <coughs> it's just a result of many experiments. So <coughs> that's not a question for the web sign, it's something just to look at. Uh, here, the can. This is a conductor. And I can move it. So the charge back exerts force of attraction. Now we can try an insulator. A wood is an insulator. Just to see the force, it's easier to put it on a pivot. And now we can see, again, attraction. So when I use a charged object and bring it close to a conductor, neutral conductor or neutral insulator, we observe attraction. 
How can we explain that? <coughs> well, that's one question. And uh, to see what is happening, we should look inside. Let's say uh, a conductor. That doesn't matter. Can or just sphere. A neutral conductor has exactly the same number of positive charges and negative charges. That's it. Now what is happening when I bring close to it a strongly charged object? Well, this bat Uh, as we know, according to triboelectric series, is negatively charged. It, it has extra electrons. And uh, when we bring it closer and closer to the can, what should be happening to those electrons inside the can? Since like charges repel each other, the electrons inside this can will be repelled by the electrons on the bat. As a result, what do we have? We have the same negatively charged object close to still neutral object, but inside that neutral object, the balance between positive charges and negative charges is broken. We have more positive charges close to the back and we have less positive charges <coughs> because electrons moved away so as the result we have effective attraction that's it and we saw it inside a wood a piece of wood situation is slightly different <coughs> because electrons cannot easily run away in wood wood is an uh, is insulator so what is happening we call it a polarization. So inside wood, okay, we, we get the same back, negatively charged. <coughs> and uh, this is a piece of wood. <coughs> of course, it has molecules, and each individual molecule is neutral. But now, each individual molecule becomes polarized. Now, this similar process which is happening to the whole can starts happening to the individual molecule. So here the molecule which is close to the surface becomes polarized. It becomes, you know, if, if you imagine it was spherical, now it gets longer like a ellipse and uh, Electrons now getting farther away, they don't run away. They still in the inside the same the same molecule. And of course, similar situation with the second layer of molecules. They all become polarized, etc. etc. In fact, the insulator now starts having like a, a layer of positive charges on one side and a layer of negative charges on another side. The total charge is still zero. It's still neutral. But the distribution of the charge inside now is not uniform. But of course, again, now we have observed, observed effective attraction. So, when you observe an attraction, it might mean two different things. Number one, both objects carry charge, and one charge is positive, second charge is negative. Or, number two, one object has strong charge, and another is neutral but polarized by the strong interaction from the first charged object. The repulsion, if you, <coughs> so this is the picture, yeah. better picture, 
insulator conductor. And uh, in my example, I used a negatively charged object. Practice at home. Imagine what would be happening if you would be bringing positively charged object close to a neutral one. <coughs> now, repulsion, I wanted to say, is different. If we observe repulsion, that means both objects have charge and they both are either positive or negative. That's good about repulsion. So that's what people use to observe the presence of a charge. What is happening here? This is a conductor, like a cam. So when I bring this <coughs> negatively charged back close to this plate, it pushes electrons down, and because this is made of aluminum, electrons can easily run down. So what you have here at the bottom, two objects, both negatively charged, they repel each other, and uh, that's why we can see the arm of this device is moving. We call it electroscope. And uh, the angle, of course, is related to the strength of the charge. The more angle, gravity is the same, the force of gravity. But the more angle means stronger repulsion. Now, what did I do? I charged it. So I knew that I had some extra electrons, and I scratched them off. And now we can see a constant repulsion. Now this whole electroscope is negatively charged. I moved some electrons on it. And I, if I want to discharge it, I can just touch it. This uh, situation is different. I just touched. Touching, scratching, the result is different. Why? Well, because when I just touch it, I don't have enough electrons being moved. And they cannot run on its own because that's insulator. So I really have to touch this plate at many different places to bring the charge, you know, to discharge it. <coughs> this is what we call charging by contact. There's another way, which we call charging by induction. First, I'm inducing the charge. I, I got to be quick. What happened? What do you think? Well, <coughs> this is a situation when a picture might help. So, it was neutral. When I placed, doesn't matter what shape, the bat, which is negatively charged, close to the plate, but that it didn't touch it. We know that makes electrons <coughs> travel down. That's why we observe some deflection. Uh, so what we have here, some uncompensated positive charge, because all the electrons ran down. This situation shows what was happening before I touched it. My finger is a conductor. So when I touch, it's like connecting a wire just for the moment, for a single moment. That's what we call grounding. 
that gives an opportunity to electrons to run away. When I connect the grounding, put it in my finger. I have five, yes. Or in, in engineering and physics, people call it grounding. It's not just a <coughs> constant grounding, it was just a momentarily grounding. As a result, all those electrons, because they repel each other, run away. So after the grounding, which took a fraction of a second, electrons run away. What charge left? If, el if electrons ran away, positive, that's it. So now this electroscope remains positively charged, still repel each other, still observe repulsion. And the difference between charging by, well, we can say charging by touching and charging by induction if the result can charge. If I had it negative and I scratch electrons, it becomes negative. Electrons just transferred from here to here. But when I charge by induction, it becomes positive. The, <coughs> the uh, object charged by induction has charged opposite to the object used to charge. And the, all we need to do is to see is the right picture which shows how electrons move. That's it. It's very helpful. Yes? Yes. Did you see? It was painful. <laughs> <coughs> Not as painful as if you, you know. <laughs> it happened. Many times. Well, okay, uh, this slide is supposed to have this picture on it. So uh, we know the difference now between charging by induction, charging by <coughs> touching or in, in, in contact and many, many different situations can be described by answering this question. What would electrons do? That's it. Electrons. <coughs> because again, protons never move. It's all about electrons moving one way or another. All right, yeah, we, we know. That. So, slides by induction and uh, again the law of consideration of charge tells us that in the end no matter what's happening total charge of a system remains constant and now we're gonna write an equation for this law for each law you write an equation so if we have a system it doesn't matter if it's composed of one object, two objects, many objects, you can always calculate the total charge. That's what basically it is. The number of protons times the elementary charge, the number of electrons times the charge of the electron. In a neutral object, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons, Q is zero. If we break the balance, if we remove electrons, it becomes positive. If we add extra electrons, the object becomes negative. And no matter what's happening inside the system, total charge remains constant. And now we are ready to answer this question. In this experiment, this is what I do. I have two plastic spheres. And I charge those spheres. How? Well, for example, Take a piece of fur and rub it. Mechanical interaction, fur plastic, makes its negative charge, negatively charged. 
and wherever. Let's make it negative again. It's easier. If I had a very, very sensitive measuring device, I could measure force. They should repel each other. What do I do now? Technically, I should wear gloves. But imagine that I have insulator, these insulating pads here. So this is what I do. That's it. Question is, what do you think should happen to the charge on each sphere in this experiment? Let's see. So, um, anybody would like to say what do you think? Yes. I don't think it would change its charge. Because the electrons won't spin out. So, uh, answer number two. Okay. What do you think? Number two. So, uh, of course, I can look inside, but just raise your hand if you think they, they will change the charge. What does the word plastic mean? Insulator. Insulator. And uh, inside an insulator, electrons what? They don't move. So, if I use plastic spheres, nothing changes. That's why I asked this question, now you remember. I need spheres or other objects made of copper <coughs> or aluminum or any conductive material. In that case, when we touch them, immediately electrons start moving. <coughs> That's why we call those materials <coughs> conductors. So, in this situation, we have two I don't know, copper spheres. One carries positive charge, the one on the left. Second is negatively charged. Uh, we can calculate total charge. The capital Q represents 10 to the 22nd electrons. That's it. And we touch those spheres for a fraction of a second. That's enough. And of course, in that situation, <coughs> the charge will change. And uh, we need to answer a question, how? But I'm sure first we can think about it in terms of this actually, uh, this phenomenon when electrons move in space has a name, electric current. So basically we're generating momentarily electric current. And electrons will move now, we know, because both spheres are conductive. And uh, if they move, we only have two options. So you don't really, you don't really need to read all, all of them. Yeah. It's only from A to B, or from B to A. What would be the most wrong answer to this question? Number five. This is the most wrong answer. Because the electrons actually always move. They move in atom when they orbit. And then they move between objects. And they never said. You don't know, I know. <laughs> so, of course, what did you say? What uh, choice did you make? That's the punishment for being close to me. <laughs> punishment means the opposite. From, from A to B or from B to A? So, uh, a good the representation of an object with a deficiency of electrons is just having pluses. These pluses demonstrate how many extra protons it might have. Of course, in reality, there are many, many more. 
but the, those protons still uh, compensated by certain electrons. This object has extra electrons, and we only need to see extra electrons. And uh, <clears throat> if we touch First of all, electrons repel other electrons, and electrons being attracted by opposite charges. So these electrons, which free to move now, use that opportunity and move. In which direction? So electric current would exist for a fraction of a second, for how long doesn't matter, but what matters is eventually, eventually, any movement stops. The new equilibrium is reached. And uh, when should it happen? What do you think? When there is no motion anymore. A, Q, B, right? Yes. So, Q, A initial was equal to seven times whatever charge it is. Q, B initial was equal to negative three times some factor. But eventually, if we let them touch <coughs> each other, what should happen? What do you think? electrons from A move to A. Until what? Until they are equal. Until they are equal. Well, <clears throat> it's in the picture, but it would be actually nice to add it to They have the same size, it's important, which means they have the same capacity to keep the charge. If one sphere would have been larger than another sphere, that sphere would collect more charge. However, if spheres have the same size, the final charge, final, also should be the same. Any questions? on this part. Is this a law of conservation of charge? See, there was a list of laws here. Newton's first, second, third, etc., etc. Of course, we needed to apply a law of conservation of electrical charge. So, is this a law of conservation of charge? If you think, yes, just not. You're wrong. <laughs> Conservation means you have to compare something before and after, not after and after. Some things might be changing, but when you compare something what was before change happened and after, and if that thing is the same, that's what means conservation. And what do we need to compare? Well, we need to compare the total charge of the system before spheres brought together system. Total. Before. How do we write it? QA initial plus QB initial. That's what the total charge of the system before we touch the spheres should be equal to. Now, there is a total charge of the system after. How do we calculate this? Q 
QA final plus QB final. Is this a law of conservation of charge? No. This is just a definition of total charge. Like total mass is the sum of masses of individual parts. Total charge is the sum of individual parts of the system. So how should we write the law of conservation of charge? The charge of the system before anything happens should be equal to the charge of the, say, the same system after. This is the law of conservation of electrical charge. Everything else is a preparation. But now we can solve it. First of all, we know the initial charge on the first sphere, we know the initial charge on the second sphere, and also we know that final charge on the first sphere should be equal to the final charge on the second sphere because they have the same size. So this is what we do right now. 7q plus negative 3q should be equal to QA final times 2 because again this is QA initial this is QB initial this is QA final and this is QB final again well, by now, everybody knows very well, without any doubt, that it's really hard to read what they write. <coughs> That's why you have to write your own notes. Maybe I'm doing this on purpose. So, 7q minus 3q divided by 2, 7 minus 3, 4, 4 over 2, 2. 2 times Q, we can actually calculate the actual charge because this factor has been given to us. It should be equal to 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th times 10 to the 22nd, wherever it is. That will be coulombs. How do I know that I have to use this number for this factor? background involved in this course, reading <laughs> so mathematics, it's important background. And if you watch the uh, lecture number one for the <coughs> 1105 course, it gives you a little bit more description. All right, uh, that's the answer. And uh, we just have found the final charge, which is the same for both spheres, and that's supposed to be equal to, so I have back my designator calculator, please, <laughs> please tell me the answer, um, 3.2 times 10 to, when we uh, solve problems like that, we should practice in using uh, scientific notation. Yeah, so you should practice in using something like this, 3.2 times 10 to the what? Third. Third. Kilo. Coulombs. 
and actually probably the <coughs> high probability if you have solved a similar problem on a web design, your uh, final answer probably would be using Kila, so, uh, Kila, uh, Kulans, or this is actually a really, really difficult to charge uh, any object because one Kulan is a very, very strong charge. It's really, really tough to generate it. And this is uh, this is kind of fictional situation, but still. Well, and uh, that's an answer for sphere B. What was happening? We know it had extra electrons because it was negative. And when we touch sphere B with sphere A, those electrons start running away. We can actually calculate how many electrons ran away. And we just need to compare initial charge and final. The change, final minus initial, will be equal to 5 Qs. That's how many electrons actually moved during that uh, I don't know, instant, almost instant touching. The new equilibrium is reached very quickly. You don't have to hold it for hours. You just touch, and basically that's it. All right, how many extra uh, electrons did it have? Please. How many electrons moved? Please. How many electrons does it miss after everything balanced? This. Any questions? This is how the law of conservation of charge generally works for any situation. Now we're going to talk about forces. <coughs> we know about forces. Everything we need to know because we've studied forces extensively, and uh, this is just a straightforward application of everything we've learned plus one additional equation. The additional equation is this, Coulomb's law. But we apply it to a very important model, an electron orbiting a proton in a hydrogen atom. simplest approach is to assume that the electron travels in a circle, a uniform circular motion. That's an electron, that's a proton. An electron is being attracted. This is the same Coulomb's force, which is given by the Coulomb's law, and that uh, what, what else do we know about circular motion? There is one word, everything, exactly. For example, that includes the direction of the acceleration. How does it point? Toward the center of the circle. It also includes the magnitude of this acceleration. I'm going to write it in slow in a minute. Magnitude of the acceleration. V squared over the radius of this circle. And uh, <coughs> we also know that acceleration, force, and mass are related by Newton's second law. Newton's. Second law. If we know that a certain law is involved, we must write it. The Newton's second law says net force acting on an object will be equal to the mass of that object multiplied by acceleration of that object. In this situation, there is only one force acting on the electron, Coulomb's force. And of course, we need to calculate the magnitude of what we're looking for, speed, right? 
here, speed. Speed is a part of magnitude of centripetal acceleration, so the magnitude of Coulomb's force equals m times magnitude of centripetal acceleration, which is m times v squared over r. And Coulomb's force equals to Coulomb's constant Uh, I will write it like this. This is what we call the elementary charge. The magnitude of a smallest portion of a charge in the universe. The electron is negative, but these vertical bars tell us we just need to multiply two positive numbers, that's what it is. Now we can uh, solve it for the speed. It is equal to square root a constant charge squared mass radius and we know the mass, we know the radius, we just have to plug numbers in, we know the constant and I believe I have a slide with the number about two uh, million meters per second. Uh, we will be using this model in five weeks again when we talk about quantum properties of matter. And <coughs> Any questions? This is how we can apply the Coulomb's law to any similar situation when something is moving or not. Let's say we have several charges. Each charge is being held in space at a certain location by something, by a glue, somebody's hand. They don't move. So, <coughs> we call it equilibrium, it doesn't really <coughs> matter. Equilibrium, but not electric equilibrium. If we calculate net force, net electric force on its charge, it will not be equal to zero. That's our goal. But, of, but we should imagine there's a hand which holds each charge. So, if I remove that hand, the net force would not be zero and charges would move. We may need to calculate acceleration sometimes, but if we know the force, if we know the mass, acceleration is force over mass, that's it. <coughs> so, this is a picture, not a diagram. If we need to calculate the net force acting on any object, what do we draw? Three body diagram. <coughs> Now, in this picture, you see three objects, three charges. But you only need to draw one free body diagram, free body diagram for the charge in the question. So here, in this slide, free body diagram should show forces acting only on charge number forces acting only on the charge number Why? No. You see, it's about reading on the charge number one. On the next slide, on the charge number two. On the next slide, on the charge number three. But we don't do them together. It only will confuse us if we try to do all at the same time. So the charge number one, how many forces should we draw acting on the charge number one? Two. Each other charge exerts a force. So uh, the direction of the force might be to the left or to the right. For example, if I want to draw a vector, an arrow, which represents the force acting. This is how we call it. Okay. 
acting on the charge number one from the charge number two. How should I point that there? What do you think? What do you think? Force acting on the charge number one from the charge number two points uh, from one to two. This direction has a name. How do we call this direction? Right. It's much easier to say points to the right. Because, you have to finish, because there is a reason for every statement we make in physics must be a reason. What is the reason? Uh, I like charges attraction. Absolutely correct. You have to say this charge is positive, this charge is negative. So negative charge attracts positive charge toward itself. That's it. What about uh, force 1, 3? Plus and plus repel each other. Now, can we calculate this magnitude? Of course, the magnitude of this force will be equal to K times Q1 times Q2 divided by distance 1, 2 squared. Or in numbers, that should be 9 times 10 to the 9th. 3. Micro. We need to know what a symbol like that might mean. Micro, milli, nano, pico. Micro. And micro means negative 6. Now, should I write a 5 or a negative 5 for the second charge? It's an important question. 5 microcoulombs or negative 5 microcoulombs. So, if I don't want to keep absolute value symbol anymore, I just make all numbers positive. If I write it a minus, I should keep positive, uh, I should keep the symbol vertical bars. And distance, what distance should I, what number should I use for distance? Point 0.2, so I'm saying, because we cannot use centimeters. We have to use international system of units. That has to be squared. That's it. The magnitude, so 9 times 3 times 5 divided by 0.2 squared and 10 to the 9 minus 6 minus 6. we've been using international system of units, the unit is automatically newtons for the force. But that's only magnitude over one force. <coughs> now we need to calculate the magnitude of a second force acting on this charge. Same equation, constant, charge one. Now, second charge is the third. Do you see that? And the distance now is supposed to be between charges 1 and 3 squared. So now, in numbers, 3 microcoulombs, 8 microcoulombs. And the total distance is a half of a meter now. So please just tell me the number. Uh, don't have much space left. I still need the last piece of X screen for the net force. Hmm? Maybe. <coughs> so again, as you know, if I don't calculate it myself and the number is wrong, it's not my fault. 
spheres. Now, to calculate the net force, we have to add the forces. It's a reminder, net force is equal to the sum of all forces acting. Could have been more. And we need to remember each force is a vector. So we cannot just bluntly add magnitudes. That would be completely wrong. In this situation, one force points to the right, so it has a positive component. Second force points to the left, so it has a negative component. So F net relative to x axis is equal to, well, this is how we can write it. The x component of the first force plus the x component of the second force. But in numbers, this is what we need to write. On Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, I don't really care about numbers, how I write them. But on Wednesdays, I write perfect fourth, so. I might change it, and I know it's a new course. But so far, any questions? 99% of this calculation is based on the theory from the Y105. Only one additional equation we've used is the Coulomb's law. Yes? Why was the F13 uh, negative 0 point for finding the F10? You have to be more specific. On the last time where we did F net X and then we did Here? F, that one, why is it negative? What do you think? Well, I would assume it was going in a. Would, indicate direction. That is correct. So um, there is a difference between very important difference between magnitude, which is length, and a component, which is a number. The magnitude is never negative. When vector points to the left or to the right or up and down, the magnitude is always just some positive number. But the component depends on the orientation, on the direction. And uh, for vectors which point <coughs> in positive x direction. And that's the only direction we use for horizontal axis. Components are positive, and uh, a vector which points in negative x direction should have a negative component. And now, at this point, you should refresh Refresh means Google. Components of a vector, or you can go to, uh, actually, you have no access to PYL and five. Well, anyway, components. The difference between a vector, a magnitude, and a component. That's what will be used here. This vector points to the left, so it has a negative component. This also is related to vector addition. You should refresh what it means. It means Google. Or come to office hours and we will discuss it. <coughs> now, I'm not going to solve this problem in, in, in the same way I did it here. Let's just draw Everybody diagram. For the second charge, we have two forces which point in opposite directions. This is what we should call two, three, because it's being attracted to the third one. This is what we should call two, one. Now, by the way, two, one has the same magnitude as one, two. So no need to calculate again. Why? What do you think? Newton's law says every four has an equal opposite. Third law, exactly. Newton's third law saves time, so we don't have to repeat the same calculation. So actually, it's not a question mark anymore. 
third Newton's law. And to calculate this force, you need to do this thing, Q2, Q3, magnitude, the distance between these two charges squared, and the net force, the net force has the x component which will be equal to magnitude of this minus magnitude of this. Could be negative, could be positive. It depend, depends on. See, this charge is stronger, but it's located farther away. So we really have no ability to predict which force will be stronger. It might be even zero. It depends on actual number. That's it. You just need to plug numbers and calculate. And uh, here, what do we have? <coughs> well, the charge number three is repelled by number one, but attracted by number two. And by the way, the magnitude of this force is equal to the magnitude of this force, which has been found already. The magnitude of this force is equal to the magnitude of this force, which already has been found. So the x component of the net force will be equal to this magnitude minus this magnitude. And again, it is what it is. Any questions? There is one more example which already solved with numbers. So here, uh, the net force is being calculated on the charge number one, which here between charges two and three. Same strategy. Why is it a minus? Well, because the charge acting on the first charge from the third, the force, the force acting on the first charge from the force points to the left. Charge number one is being repelled by charge number three. We have to say attraction or repulsion because that tells the direction of a force and then direction of a force tells us a plus or a minus in the final calculation. All right, I am done today, but today is a special day. So first, you have to come back because I need this from you. But since you're here anyway, you should find your name on this piece of sheet and sign. They all identical. You don't have to sign five times. You just have to do it once on any sheet. So if you didn't take the syllabus, please take the syllabus. I need your one, two, three, five.
Adam, which love are you in? Tomorrow, no? no. So, the building will be closed tomorrow. Okay, so 
Right. Well, of course, you, you should read the syllabus. It tells everything. Okay. Friday will be on the Tuesday schedule, but it doesn't affect us. So Friday will be just regular lecture. That's it. No labs. Okay. Because this week we only have one lab. So B2 and B4 sections do it on Wednesday, and I think other two sections do it on Thursday. That's it. So there's only one lab this week? Yes, okay. that's what the uh, syllabus is for. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Okay. okay. Yes. So only one lab this week? Yes, only one lab. Only one lab this week, Wednesday, Thursday. So my lab session is Monday and Wednesday afternoon, so I still go to the uh, Wednesday one. Just on Wednesday, you go to your to, to do the lab, right? Yeah, okay, thank you. That's it. In the syllabus, it says which lab section. I can tell you. Uh, no, you should check previous page. Here, no labs, no labs. So, what section you're in? I'm not sure, but I'm going. If you're before, so you're going to do the lab on Wednesday. Uh, 2.30 to 6, I think. At 2.30 to 6, yes. Right, so, see, next week we will have lives on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And the, the, the week after the next, we will have only one lab again, so, see. Yes. Um, what he was asking about the web design question, is it completeness or if it's right? Why do you worry? I was just wondering if like, you get something wrong with that negatively. Yeah. Um, I have a very complicated system for calculating the lecture grade, so I cannot tell you. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. Uh, Are we doing So you're switching. So you're switching from this to this. Uh, I think that's it. Effective. What day today? The third. Did I get that wrong for four? I think it's still an drop form, but I just. Uh, I've never seen that before, but that shouldn't matter. It's hard to read. <laughs> yeah, one of them, one of them. You should write it so people could read from which section into which section. Actually, this should be here because it should be from to, you see, from to, and you should give it to people and they will, and you need to, you need to do this, this, this. I have one more yes. For the first exam, I have a wedding in North Dakota the week seven before. I know the syllabus said, so like it's on the Monday and then at the weekend it's for driving oh, in North Dakota. And I know the syllabus said you don't allow makeup suits or any way yeah. I could possibly take it earlier or later. Okay. Um, um, in this case, particular, in this particular case, you can take it on Tuesday. Okay, okay. so it's like since I started. How right after the right exam, after okay. you need to send me yeah. an email I like about it this situation it probably like on Wednesday, so you can remind me because uh, I will. Well, it, it happened before, uh, but uh, I will have to kind of prepare an exam just for you. Yeah, but usually. Uh, Right after the lecture, we can have a lecture. Thank you. Stay with me. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And what types of practice problems? The textbook or? Well, first of all, some practice problems are already available on the website. Right. So I suggest first <coughs> try to solve at home on your own every problem we do in, in the class. Okay. And uh, of course, every homework problem sh should be as clear as possible. Right. And uh, we also have special exercises at the end of each lab. Okay. It has a certain uh, problem solving component. So these problems, I would say, represent the closest to what exam problems might look like. So if you absolutely confident how to solve all these three types of problems, labs, lectures, and homework, you should be almost ready for any exam problem. Exam problem not exactly the same. Right. They twisted this sim similar but not exactly the same. But the way of thinking is the same. So that's what I always, always recommend. Oh, and uh, uh, we have enough office hours right. available for all students, so I always recommend don't wait. Uh, if you have any uh, questions about any, any anything, something that was unclear in class, something, you know, at homework, send an email. Come to office okay. hours, just be active. Right, okay. And then I didn't have my BU ID on me, so I don't have the yeah, number. Can I just bring it next Wednesday. time? Wednesday. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. I'll see you next uh, time. Second, uh, zero 07, uh, zero 02, that matter, about uh, 17. All right. Do you sign this for now? That's no, that's advisors. This oh, is okay. your instructor. Right. Thank you so, so much. So you should give it to right. back back to the office. They should switch it. Okay. Ah, uh, guys, and that and it's she. Yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, I I took your class um, I think two years ago. I probably remember your face because Do I, you? yeah. <laughs> you took P one hundred five. One hundred five. Yeah, in the spring. Uh, one, so one those, if you still have those notes, they should be helpful because right now a lot of stuff will be based on mechanics, on forces, yeah. you know, vectors. Yeah, 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 like force equations. That yeah. yeah. I, I, I say dig in for it. <laughs> so yeah. it's all, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's not mine. Yeah, I, I think that's yours. All right, now yeah. it's mine. Thank you. Uh, will we be teaching lab as well, or some the TF? No, labs. I don't teach labs. TF teaching fellows will be working with you. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you.